You know, before I get going, um, I was asking myself a question of like, you know, why, why us? Why are we here? Why is there a partner community for SAS? And, and what, are we, what are we doing? And then how are we going to do it? So Jared talked a little bit about the how, but I just want to spend just a second on the why and the what. So I think the, I think the why is that fundamentally uh, we really need each other. Partner leaders need each other because this is really complicated. And I don't know about you, but I got a little confused this morning listening to all these presentations about, well, you could do this and you could do that and a little bit of influence up here and a little of that over there. And after all, you're like, where do I focus? You know, where do I start? How do I make a case to my CEO that I am as valuable as a partner contributing versus marketing or sales? So that's kind of like the, the why. And the what ultimately is we have the potential to save the, the B2B SaaS industry. Because despite what you heard from Scott Brinker, the B2B SaaS industry is in trouble. And it's principally in trouble because the partnering between the SaaS companies bites by and large. And you'll soon see some data about what's going on in B2B SaaS. And in our view, the only solution to the B2B SaaS problems is to get partner ecosystems and community ecosystems right. So we are potentially the savior of B2B SaaS. And guess what? If partnerships win, business wins. And if business wins, our planet wins. So if we take what we do in partnerships, which is to create trust-based relationships with others and show our organizations how by doing the same thing internally, marketing does it with partners, product does it with partners, sales does it with partners, customer sex does it with partners, our internal organizations then have to treat our partners with respect and dignity and honor, and our whole companies change. So I've gone on and on about this notion of building trust through service and the fact that Maybe ecosystems is potentially a game changer, not just for fast growth and crushing it, but also with making the planet better. So I'm going to hold on to that one and keep fighting. That's, if people ask me, like, well, why are you still doing this, dude? I mean, you've been doing this forever. And it's principally because I fundamentally believe that partnerships and ecosystems are potentially the best way to grow and the best way to help the world. So I'm super psyched about that passion, and I hope you share that. And, and I think if, if you're wondering about that, and you're thinking if that's really true, look at the quality of individuals around you and ask the question, is there any other community where you have this kind of high level of intelligence, empathetic understanding, care and concern, willingness to volunteer, willingness to help each other? If you, anybody spends any time in CSA or partnership leader Slack and you look at the level of engagement that's going on, we are here for each other. I mean, it's freaking amazing. That is inspiring. And if we can bring that same energy to our companies and our same energy to our ecosystems, I don't think this dream of B2B partnerships saving SaaS and SaaS potentially saving business and business saving the world is really that far-fetched. So let's make it happen. Okay, so um, I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about how mics at CSA are not so good. Um, at least my mic is staying on, but I, I feel like I have like a, I'm hearing myself in my head. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. So um, I have, uh, and my team has um, Andy and Francesca here with me. We've spent quite a lot of time thinking about like, why do we need a new term? And for those of you who listened to my heavyweight bout with Jay back in December, Jay said, we don't need a new term. CEOs already get this, just do go to market. I think he was wrong. I think we do need a new term because go to market is broken. And here's why. So digital technologies, have completely reimagined everything about software, everything about industry. You, you saw uh, Brinker's uh, MarTech stack going from you know, 150 companies, which looks awful a lot, lot like what the ecosystem stack stack looks like now, and then 10 years later, he's got like 8,000. That's because of all this stuff. All these APIs and algorithms and AIs and SaaS cloud-based economics have produced this panoply of opportunity, this panoply of technology. And what's happened as a function of that is that these new network of actors has emerged. We call it the ecosystem. And they're interacting with each other in really dynamic ways that have never been before. You know, we, you now have situations where you've got multiple system integrators and consultants interoperating with multiple software packages, with multiple integrations across multiple environments. And that's being replicated and networks are being created and flywheels are being emerged. All of that stuff is happening in the new ecosystem that didn't happen before. And 
This ecosystem is becoming increasingly important, mostly because the go-to-market returns of the past are diminishing. If you look at the companies who are building platforms and building ecosystem networks, they're vastly outperforming the ones who don't. So if you're still in a go-to-market mode, you're still thinking go direct the customer and kind of ignore that stuff that's around the customer that fundamentally has influence impact, then you're missing the opportunity to do these, five, these four things. Create awareness and understanding about how that's driving the market. Figure out how you can create differentiation and competitive advantage, which is really a big deal because it's almost impossible to create competitive advantage without an ecosystem, given the stickiness and the dynamics of it. The fact that we now have all these new contributions that come from value and growth and societal contributions, so all this is coming from the ecosystem being this new dynamic, this new force in the marketplace has taken over. And what's happening is that we're moving from this closed environment where we used to think about going direct to the customer, we used to think about creating moats and creating uh, uh, all kinds of competitive challenges to switching. We used to go direct to the customer, we used to market and sell these stovepipes to an environment where it's all about co-innovation. It's all about finding new ways to innovate and then turning those co-innovations into new routes to market. And that's one of the things that was good this morning is that we've got this massive explosion of routes to market that can no longer be canonically talked about as like a channel in this sort of like linear stovepipe. And that's producing these flywheels and these network effects. And just really quickly on that, I mean, the big difference between now and say 10 years ago is if you don't have customers and partners and communities acting in reciprocal relationship with each other. In other words, more community equals more partners equals more customers. More customers equals more partners and communities. More partners equals more community and partners. If you don't have that stuff going on, and your business model does not look like that today, you've not gotten there yet. The ultimate maturity is when your business is, as Adam Chen from Andreessen Horowitz, who wrote a freaking great book called The Cold Start Problem, if you don't have the creation of what are called atomic networks that are automatically producing flywheel effects in your business model, you haven't gotten there yet. So if you're not there, just look at your business and say, do we have substantive network effects that are driving automatic growth in markets? And if the answer is no, you now have your work cut out for you. And if you're a partner leader and your CEO doesn't have this and your business doesn't have this, you've got two choices, either make it happen or go find a new job because that's the future. And that's why, fundamentally, you know, we need a new approach. So I mentioned earlier that SaaS was in trouble. Here's the data. So Scott talked about the fact that you know, 175,000 B2B software companies today forecasted to be five times more of those by 2028. But look at the perspective of a customer. You've got SaaS turning over like crazy. You've got all kinds of unused licenses. You've got customers who are not, in, not only just saying you better have this stuff integrated, they're demanding it. There's a stat that I mentioned to Scott today that MarTech purchases, the first one in two criteria for a customer buying MarTech is does it integrate with internal stuff, does it integrate with external stuff. If these integrations don't get created by us, we are the front line of integrations. How many of you have a tech partner program? There'll be a lot of hands go up. Okay, your tech partner program is one of its biggest jobs, what? is to find out who you should integrate with and create good solutions for your customers, right? That's the table stakes for a tech partner program. What happens if we get that right is that, there would be a pointer, is that we solve for this problem here, right? We solve for the problem of interoperability if we build good integrations. So when I said that partner ecosystems are the best hope to save the software industry, there's the data. And who among us is the person or persons who is going to make it happen. Partner leaders. So there it is. It's you. And we need each other to figure out how to do it. Because honestly, I may be a quasi-expert at this stuff, but you know where I, you know how I learn about how this works? I talk to you. And you learn by talking to each other. Because I've learned more about this business talking to the people that I'm advising. So I'm kind of just like a magpie running around and collecting all this information about what you already told me and then I'm just packaging it. And so that's, you know, maybe adding a little sauce. But fundamentally, I'm learning from you. You learn from each other. If we're not doing that, we're going to screw this up. So let's not screw up the software industry. Let's get partner integrations and relationships with our tech partners right so that we can solve for customer problems so they don't churn us out. Okay. So that's all that, so far that's all, that's the, that's all the bad news it just gets kind of happier from here, okay. So for those of you who have heard about the GoTo ecosystem movement, it's basically about a transformation. Now, 
Let's talk a little bit about this. When you got hired in your first partnership job, did the CEO say, hey, go out there and make partnerships happen, and then I want you to come back and transform the business? You probably didn't hear that, right? You probably just heard, go out there and get me some partners. I need revenue. Or somewhere along the lines, I thought that maybe there were some partners out there that we could integrate with, or maybe some channel partners or agencies, and maybe we should do deals with them. I don't know. Just go figure it out. And then you went out there and you did it, and then the first question came back is, show me the money. How many people know that problem? Yeah. And what happens is you go scrambling around looking for the money, going in the wrong direction. Because the, this ecosystem business is a transformation. The only way that last thing happens, right, where the integrations work to save the software industry, is if we transform our business. And we have to do that in two ways. The first way is we have to get our programs aligned, meaning the program sitting in the partner organization, right, without participation from product, marketing, sales, and customer success is broken, is immature, is problematic because there's no way that the company is going to support the partner if it's only us in the partner organization running around screaming about things. It's only when it's integrated into those organizations. And the second thing we have to do is we have to go to our finance department, our CFO, our strategy people, and if you don't have one, your CEO, and say, are we, are we selling products or are we building a network? So remember that book I told you, Adam, the Andrew Chen, The Cold Star Problem? He had a great quote. They come for the product, they stay for the network. This is the canonical platform business model change that you saw Uber do and Slack do and a whole bunch of other companies do. But whether or not you have a technology platform or not is not important. What is important is that you find a way to build atomic networks around parts of your business. Remember, community, partner, customer, you create a flywheel. More products, more, more partners, more customers, more communities, and on and on and on it goes. And you're not going to be able to do it from day one. You're going to do it in segments. But your job, fundamentally as partner leaders, is to prove the model and get these things aligned, and then work the model into a network. And that's what causes the transformation. So that's basically what GoTo ecosystem is, is this transformation movement that gets aligned programs and networked businesses to work together. And I, I, get, I get a little bit of annoyed when you see things like platforms and ecosystems. It's like, can't we just call it, your, what's your ecosystem strategy? And know that if you get it right, you're going to crush it with a network effect. And then we just can be really clear. Ecosystems is the best way to grow and save the planet. We're in charge. Make us ecosystem chiefs and give us a big bunch of money. Well, maybe that doesn't work. But I'll show you how. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you've got to be here, either at your company, or someone gets hired above you, or you go to another company. But that's the upper right-hand corner. That's the, that's the land grab. Here's what happens if you get it right. The bar on the top are the pure play platform companies who in essence have aligned programs and networked ecosystems. And look at the performance. And even if you make a slight correction over here for the last couple of, you know, last year or so it went up and then went down a lot, maybe it's, you know, it's right about there, but it's still pretty darn good compared to the rest. This is a CEO issue. And if your CEO doesn't right now understand that ecosystems is the best way to, to be on the top of that chart rather than in the, in the blue and the red, it's again your job to help them understand that. So partners have a big job. Big partner leaders have a big, big job. But as in all journeys, it all starts with the first step. And the first step is to understand where you are. So we have spent a lot of time thinking about the steps to building the GoTo ecosystem model. You first, you get your strategy right. Your strategy's got the entire roadmap, even if it's a North Star vision that says, here's what we look like when we get this network effect thing really spinning and we've got ourselves positioned. You figure out how to align your organization. That was that vertical axis of aligning the programs to the, organ to the, uh, to the different lines, to the different organizational functions. And then you orchestrate the ecosystem by bringing all that stuff to the market. Now, that's all great consultant talk. But like, what do you do tomorrow? Well, what you do tomorrow is you figure out where you are. We've created, uh, as Jared mentioned, uh, we're on a journey to codify the first ecosystem maturity model that's ever existed for SaaS companies. It's, it's going to be very focused on B2B SaaS companies. We're not going to try to boil the ocean and talk about oil and gas companies and, and car manufacturers. It's going to be four SaaS companies. And it looks at these four stages. The first two stages are the show me the money stages. Because the biggest problem 
that ecosystem professionals face today is that they don't have a hard ROI. The reason you don't have a lot more money for your program is because you have not demonstrated a hard ROI. What is a hard ROI? It's when you know within a decimal point of when you put a dollar in one into the investment pot, how much comes out on the other end. We don't know what it is in partnerships. Mostly because it's really hard to calculate, especially influence. Mike and I were talking at lunch about the fact that influence is just a bitch. It's really hard to calculate each and every one of these little micro benefits that come from partners helping with marketing and partners helping with products and with sales and with customer success. But there's so much value that even if we underestimate it by 50%, we will outperform marketing and sales spends. Probably the best example of that is that, you know, if I go to a sales rep, if I go to the sales leadership and I say, I can increase the performance of your sales reps by 50%, you don't have to hire any more sales reps. Your CRO is going to probably do a double take. He'll say, prove it to me. And that's what we have to do in the first two stages, is to prove to them that if you put a dollar into this ecosystem thing, you don't have to hire any more sales reps. Wouldn't that be cool? You don't get to spend half as much money on marketing and get the same result. You can have a triple your return on investment on your tech dev because you get two thirds of the tech dev being produced by someone else's balance sheet. Those are compelling outcomes. We just have to prove them. So the big part of this proving is really focusing on a very small number of partners. Guess which kind of partners? Anyone who want to guess what kind of partners? Are they agencies, system integrators, consultants, or tech partners? Who should we focus on? Tech partners, why? Because we have to save the world. Software business, I'm not kidding. Because the tech partners are the only way that we can get undue leverage. You might be able to get some leverage from a system integrator or an agency, but it will be linear. What do I mean by that? You know, if I go get an agency to go sell for me, unless my ICP is an agency, like AppBind's different because the ICP is the agency. But if your ICP is not an agency and you want to create leverage, the way you do it is by creating a force multiplier for your solution. So that instead of your solution being the, car, the wheels on the car, your solution is the car. And then anyone who sells the car sells the wheels. So using that metaphor, at scale, because the system integrator can do that too, but they can't do it at scale. If you integrate with another tech partner, you do it at scale. That's why tech partners are so much more important and valuable, not to mention the fact that the customer does not want to buy wheels. This is a really wonderful uh, story about how sales reps think the customer wants wheels when the customer wants the car. In fact, the customer already has the car. And the sales rep's not even talking about how the wheels go on the car, just you want you to have wheels. No one needs wheels. So how we fix that problem is we get a hard ROI for the sales organization to understand how we can help them sell cars. And if they sell cars, they have twice the productivity, then you don't have to hire sales reps. So that's the first two stages, launch and prove. The next two stages are where you grow that which you prove. So what is so important in this first couple stages is not to get carried away with yourself and try to do too much. Today, when you look at partner organizations, they have all these immature programs. They've got an immature tech partner program, they've got an immature agency program, an immature SI program, an immature consulting program. None of them work. And then when you do your QBR to roll up to your boss, it's like, well, I got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but it's not enough to create a hard ROI. Your job, if you don't have a hard ROI, is to spend the next six months getting one. We're going to show you how to do that, sort of. You have to fill out a survey to really give us the data that we need, but we'll get to that later. The second part is then once you have the hard ROI, you ask for money. And when you ask for money, you get the right to grow. That's when you can expand into agencies and system integrators and consultants and communities. And you can go crazy because you've got a model that works. And then from that perspective, you create competitive advantage, the network effects, and then you start to see these massively ramping partner attach rates. Which, by the way, if you do not have a partner attach rate north of 50%, it might give you an indication of which side of this continuum you're on. That's not exclusively true because there are some businesses that are intrinsically, like, like Zoom as an example. Like Zoom's a pretty mature company, but it's, Zoom's got a lot of B2C and it's a super PG, P, a product led growth. So there are exceptions to this rule, so we don't want to overgeneralize. But generally speaking, there's a watermark on partner attached. Microsoft, 95%. I'll give you an example of where they are. They're not all the way to the right, but they're, they're clearly in the leverage stage. Okay. So, I want to talk about the two most important pieces of moving from prove to scale. And they are to build the part ROI 
and then to align the organization with the ecosystem. So we just spent a little bit of time on this. And for those of you who are going to Supernode, I'm going to be spending all of my time talking about these two with an emphasis on the one on the right. So on proof. So it is astonishing to me that the tech partner program maturity is actually pretty easy, but it gets messed up because there's not supreme levels of focus. So this is what we recommend. You select the tech partners that make the most sense for your business. Hint, use Crossbeam. Second hint, talk to customers. Third hint, talk to your sales reps. You will find in a very short order which set of tech partnerships are most important to focus on. If you're early stage, don't pick a lot of them. Pick a handful of them, three to five. If you're a little more mature, you can get up in the tens. But don't go too far north of that until you've done the following things. You have a legitimate, hard customer reference where a customer will stand up and say, this, these are the use cases that I was able to effectuate because I integrated your product with my product. And I will stand up in front of any of your customers and I will tell them what a fantastic job you did by integrating these two solutions and how that really worked. And it's even better when there's three solutions. So when you can think of it like two integrations into your product. But we don't get carried away on the, on the form. The most important thing is get a customer reference. And get a customer reference without selling anything. Don't sell the customer. Don't sell the integration. Look for a place where both your products exist. And use your customer success team, a little cajoling required, to get that customer to integrate and then test the MVP. Sometimes you find out that the integration wasn't that good and you have to fix it. Do not start selling anything to anybody until you have a legitimate solution with one or more tech partners in a given solution and no more than 10 in your total experience. And then once you have that, right, then and only then do you start working on co-selling. Handful of customers, handful of reps who are friendly, do a pilot, set it up with your leadership team, say, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to take this set of customers and this set of sales reps. We're going to sell this bundled solution because we know the use cases that require it because our customer who read the reference told us that these were the use cases, and we sell them together. We have a very, very tightly controlled pilot for co-selling. And we get the sales reps successful with that very small number of customers, with a very small number of sales reps, and they stand up at the sales meeting and say, this was great. Why aren't we doing more of this? Then you do the same thing with marketing. You got to do it in that order, by the way. Don't, don't do marketing before you do sales. Because if you do that, then you end up creating demand for something that you don't know if you can sell. But shortly thereafter, then you do the exactly the same thing with marketing. When you finish that exercise, you should, be ha you should be able to prove a hard ROI if you've done your work correctly. The only reason you wouldn't be able to is either, for one, you got distracted. You were distracted by some I don't know, some of it said, I need revenue now, go get me sourced revenue. Sourced revenue, I will say this as somewhat of a blasphemous comment, is more or less a waste of time in this model because sourced revenue does not force you to get alignment with your organization. You can maybe retire some of your quota, maybe you, get your, your, you meet your numbers, but what you'll end up doing is just doing the old-fashioned channel crap which is creating relationships on the fly, on the side, without building any scale inside your organization. And uh, I was talking to a very esteemed leader at lunch today. We were talking about bridges. You build a bridge to the customer and the partner. You build a bridge to your organization. Only influence revenue lets you build that bridge. So whether you call it hard source, light source, the bottom line is that if you can't prove a hard ROI with, from within the organizational functions that need to support and fund you, you will not be able to grow your partner program. So that's part number one. That's this whole prove your hard ROI. And we can talk more about this. If anybody wants to DM me, I'm, I'd be happy to brainstorm this with you and work it on it, because we're going to be really very provocative about helping to create these hard ROIs and do it at scale. And the second thing is aligning the functions. Now, you know what's really cool? You see that middle box right there on the left? That's the beginning of this. The difference between the middle box on the left and the one on the right is here you're asking for favors. You're not really driving full alignment yet. Over here, you're actually making the alignment happen. And usually, this doesn't happen on the right until the stuff on the left is done. Because it's kind of like, why are you wasting my time? The good news is, is that you could have a conversation at a conceptual level about how partners help marketing, sales, and product 
customer success achieve their goals. The bad news is if you don't have the hard ROI, they're like, I don't know if that's going to work. So I'm not going to turn my company upside down until you show me that you've proved the hard ROI. So these are very tied together here. But in terms of just simple terms, with product, it's about integration. Moving integrations from a static back office, pain in the butt kind of thing into something strategic that ultimately leads to a roadmap. With sales, it's attach. How do we teach the CRO that by driving partner attach, they don't have to hire the next set of sales reps? And with marketing, it's about campaigning. How do we design the partner motion into the planning process of marketing so that marketing comes to you at the beginning of the year and say, can you bring more partners in because I want some of that money? And you're like, I mean, this is the greatest, the greatest irony about the marketing equation is that marketing is under siege. Cookies are gone. Direct marketing costs are going up. Customers are being bombarded with direct marketing. The SQL, MQL, SQL, it's a big problem right now. Partners actually give you money and influence. What is better than that? You're out there trying to drive demand for your wheels. You put it on a car. The car company gives you the money for a joint campaign, and it's a better product because they have influence more than you sometimes. So for marketing, it's one of those, like, just once they get it, the, the light bulb's going to go on. OK. So here's a little bit more detail that breaks out the stages in four stages. So I'd ask you to try to find yourself on, on one of these stages. And if you have trouble doing that, ping me, and I'll help you. The first stage, uh, can you guys see that in the back? OK, sort of. Basically, the first stage is basically get your ecosystem strategy cooked. I don't think you have to go crazy and hire some management consultant to do this, although they can add value. Um, but you really want to have a North Star, right? You want to have some kind of North Star that says, I'm trying to get to that network effect, that competitive advantage, that place where I create that community partner customer flywheel so that I can actually you know, see massive growth in valuation. I want to be that company with the, that's on the curve, that, that green bar that was really high. So get your network strategy, your ecosystem strategy built. Select your beachhead segments. That may sound like an easy thing to do, but for those of you who've done this work, this, actually is, this is actually very important. If you select the wrong tech partners, you end up going in the circles. So you really got to be careful. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the selection process. Do you go with someone that's big who's going to ignore you, someone small who doesn't have any resources, someone like you? There's all these debates about this. We can help you with that if you want to talk about it. And then create priority integrations. So you exit the launch stage when you get that customer reference for 10 partners, right? One, at least one, ideally two customer references. And you can now go to your marketing and sales department in the next stage and you say, hey, do you think it'd be possible for us to start testing and figuring out how we're going to do the co-marketing and co-selling thing? And once you've got that down and you're maturing your ecosystem program and you're starting to build more of the gives and gets, because now you know what they are, you know what the partner gets, what, what you get, then you can come back and drive the, the last part of alignment, which is that second panel that I showed you in the last slide, and then begin to move into scale. As you move into scale, this is where you earn the right to expand your program. Don't be expanding your program in a bunch of different areas until you have the hard ROI, because they'll all be crappy programs. And then you'll, you really are, you think you're in scale, but you're actually in prove. I get a lot of our clients, they're, they're doing all this stuff, but they're still in launch. It's like, what are you doing? Don't do that. Focus, focus, focus. Say no more than yes to the selections of the partners you're going to work with. I'll say that again. Say no much more than yes about which partners you're going to work with until you've proven your hard ROI. And then expand, because you know what works. It's kind of like, you know, in a way, you can almost think of it as like ecosystem. Uh, you know, if we have product market fit, it's, it's almost like program ecosystem fit. Don't do the program. Don't, do, don't expand the program until you know that the partner proposition works. And then finally, uh, as we move out of that and we start standardizing and leading with ecosystem solutions, that's really cool. How much time have I got left here? One minute. Okay. So I will say that for next time, we'll talk about what we're going to do with maturity. But, but the one last thing I want to leave you with is this vision. When you get it right, your product organization will have a product roadmap that includes your ecosystem and will be making end-to-end -end solutions that go down the hill. Your marketing organization will build the, the bombs and demand generation around that joint solution with the ecosystem, which will automatically result in the sales organization being enabled because it's skewed and the customer success organization owning responsibility for delivery. That's what this looks like at scale. That's when you get this leverage. So that's kind of your north star of how you make that work. And so with that in mind, um, Jared, um, I'm going to introduce Jared. Before I do that, this maturity model that we're creating in partnership with Partner Hacker is going to be unbelievably cool. And all you have to do 
is fill out a survey so that your voice is heard. We want everybody in, in, in CSA to be in this survey. So um, Francesca's gonna pass, uh, pass out, I just, she's gonna pass out this. Please take a picture of this. There's also uh, little pictures back at the desk. Take, point your camera at that, you, at that QR code. And please, when you get the emails from us, take this survey. We'd really, really appreciate it.